Well, welcome everyone to the final webinar for 2022, um, which I think is really covering an issue that's pertinent to, to probably many who have been treated for head and neck cancer, um, particularly at this time of the year, as Nadia mentioned, you know, we, um, we do so much more socialising and connecting with family and friends and often over a meal or through, you know, over food. Uh, during this festive season. So it's a really timely issue to be discussing. Before we start, though, I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today. And for me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'm here in Victoria and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's great to see so many people who have registered again at a very busy time just before uh, Christmas. Um, many healthcare professionals, we've got patients, former patients um, and uh, carers from not only across Australia, but also overseas. So welcome to you all for, the, um, for this webinar. Just before we start and before I um, pass over, we've got, well, we've got two, hopefully we will have two great speakers who are very qualified um, to speak about this issue, um, who are going to provide us with some practical tips on the topic of eating socially after head and neck cancer. Um, Joanne being a dietitian and also doing some research in this area, and Yvonne, if she is able to join us, will be talking from her own personal experience and also as an advocate. Um, all right, well, we'll pass to Joanne uh, as our first speaker. Um, now, Joanne Hyatt is a dietitian for those who aren't uh, familiar with, with Joanne. Joanne is a um, dietitian who, until recently, was working in head and neck um, oncology at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. And she's now moved over to the Ipswich Hospital. Joanne is in the final stages of completing her PhD through the University of Queensland, where she's conducted a qualitative research study, exploring patient and carer experience of nutrition care throughout head and neck cancer treatment to identify um, areas for service improvement, a really important area and a really important issue. Joanne will present to you for about 20 minutes or so, and then there'll be an opportunity for, um, to her, her, for her to answer any questions that anybody has. So please, during um, Joanne's presentation, if you have a question, pop it in the chat function and we will try and get through as many as possible. So um, welcome, Joanne, and you're just about finished your PhD, so it's nearly going to be Dr Hyatt for you. So um, such an achievement. So um, over to you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see that or I'll just come back in? No, can't see it yet. Oh, okay. So yep. Here we go. It looks like there's something. Yes. Yep. All good now. Okay, so thank you for your very warm introduction, Kelly. Um, yeah, today I would like to share with you some research I have done that highlights the impact of head and neck cancer on the lifestyles of patients and carers with a focus today on the impact this has on socialising with others. I would then like to share findings from a recent study by a research group in the UK who have specifically studied patients' experiences of social eating following treatment for head and neck cancer, including the strategies to maximise participation in social eating. Um, and this is particularly important with this time of year with the lead up to Christmas. So just a bit of background about my role as a dietitian and my research studies. So as a dietitian, our role in supporting patients um, going through head and neck cancer treatment is to maximise nutrition intake, to prevent weight loss and essentially maintain um, strength. So preserving lean body mass. Um, and what we find is this can minimise treatment delays and unplanned hospitalisations and improve treatment outcomes. However, with the impact of the disease itself and the side effects of treatment on eating and drinking, this can be very challenging and involvement from the multidisciplinary team um, is essential to achieve the best possible outcomes. So we work very closely with the speech pathologist, nursing staff, the oncologist, surgeons and other members of the allied health team to keep on top of the symptoms a patient is experiencing. And despite having a support network available, it can be, still be very hard to achieve these nutrition goals. Also, in my experience working clinically as a dietitian, I've seen firsthand how many carers can take on the role of supporting patients with their nutrition intake. 
So this led me to want to explore what the nutrition care experience is for patients and those caring for patients with head and neck cancer to look at ways we can improve the service we provide. Um, and so I began my PhD. So the title of my PhD is Exploring Patient and Care Experience of Nutrition Care Throughout and Beyond Treatment for Head and Neck Cancer. And the first project I did involved interviews with 20 patients and 15 carers of patients from a range of treatment modalities. So some were having chemotherapy and radiation, some were having surgery alone, and some were having surgery followed by post-operative radiation. I conducted interviews at four time points, um, and that was prior to treatment commencing, and then two weeks, three months, and 12 months post-treatment completion. And in these interviews, I asked patients and carers to talk about their eating and drinking experiences and how they manage these. And every single patient and carer I interviewed spoke about the negative impact of their disease and treatment on their lifestyle, and particularly around socialising with friends and family. And I just wanted to share some of these experiences with you today. So starting with the experiences shared by patients in my study, while many patients tried to maintain the lifestyle they had prior to their diagnosis and treatment, it felt overwhelming for some to still catch up with friends and family in social settings when they could no longer eat and drink what they used to. Some patients felt it was easier to avoid these situations altogether. One patient spoke about a strategy she used to overcome her avoidance of eating out socially by identifying food and drink options she could manage as this had always been a big part of her life that she did, didn't want to continue to miss out on. Even after experiencing the elation of getting good news and being told the treatment had worked successfully, after getting PET scan results, one patient spoke about not wanting to celebrate with friends and family, or she was unable to eat and drink the same sort of foods and drinks they would normally be able to have. And this was despite their encouragement and support. And while not being able to eat and drink in the same way as prior to treatment was the biggest factor impacting socialising after treatment, some patients spoke about other side effects of treatment that also impacted on their ability to go out. One patient spoke about the changes to his hearing as a result of his chemotherapy. Many was no longer able to tolerate crowd noise. So he was no longer able to go out to restaurant and bars to catch up with friends and family. One patient spoke about how her confidence was shattered due to the impact of her surgery on her speech. She was not able to be understood when she was placing and picking up a, an order from McDonald's. <clears throat> and one patient spoke about the physical changes he experienced through his treatment with weight loss and muscle loss and how he no longer recognised himself and did not want his friends to see him like this. This is a very common experience also shared by other patients who have experienced changes to their appearance from surgical procedures and for those needing to have a nasogastric tube placed to support nutrition intake. I also wanted to share the impact this has on the lifestyle of carers. Many carers take on the role of providing nutrition support throughout and beyond the treatment period, which can impact greatly on their own lifestyle. One carer spoke about her family made changes to the way they were eating to ensure her brother did not feel excluded from mealtimes when he was struggling to eat and drink due to the impact of his tumour on his ability to chew. For many carers, supporting their loved one throughout head and neck cancer treatment had resulted in lifestyle changes. Many carers adjusted their own social activities and eating and drinking habits to avoid causing their loved one any further distress. One carer spoke about how going out to socialise with others was no longer an option as her husband was reliant on his peg for his nutrition and with his trachea, he was unable to speak. But being able to speak to other carers who were involved in the local head and neck peer support group here in Brisbane was highly valued by some carers as they were able to share their experiences with others who'd been in similar situations. And I really wanted to share this today because it's so important. Um, and what this carer described was having the support of other patients and carers, because both herself and her husband would attend this group. Um, they were able to catch up with members of the group in a social setting. And this was seen as an invaluable step to getting back to socialising with friends and family. So looking specifically at patient and carer experiences of eating socially after head and neck cancer treatment, my study found that catching up with others in social settings 
is not only impacted by changes to eating and drinking, but also by changes to body image, hearing and speech. Many carers experience similar levels of, levels of social isolation as they modify their lifestyle to place their focus on the patient and avoid them unnecessary distress by eating foods and drinks that the person they are caring for is unable to have. And peer support groups are invaluable in offering the opportunity to learn from others and can be a great starting point in wanting to start to socialize with others again. I just wanted to share with you also findings from a study conducted by researchers in the UK exploring how patients with head and neck cancer adapt and cope with social eating difficulties. The study identified key barriers impacting social eating, including being very self-conscious, having a lack of understanding of others, and also their functional issues with their eating and drinking. And the main reason I wanted to share findings from this study was because it also shared strategies used by patients to maximize their participation in social eating. The first strategy described was minimizing attention on eating. For some patients, this meant eating privately before going out socially or going out and ordering foods and drinks that were easier to manage, including soups or desserts. Some patients found that eating with a group of people was less intense than being one-on-one -on -one with a person as it took the focus off themselves. The second strategy described was managing expectations. Many patients did not anticipate the extent to which changes to their eating and drinking would impact their lifestyle. To overcome this, some patients used a trial and error approach to discover what foods they felt comfortable to go out to eat and drink prior to, to doing so. And many also emphasized the importance of taking small steps with some practicing eating with close relatives in the home environment before progressing to eating out with others. And the third and most fundamental strategy was described as getting support from other people, particularly from friends and family, so many friends and family would aim to reduce the emotional and psychological burdens that accompany social eating. Um, they would do this by cooking food that patients enjoy and provide opportunities to socialize, not always involving food. In addition, bringing immediate family um, to larger social meals, reduce their apprehension with eating. And family could also speak to um, you know, staff in restaurants on behalf of the patient, if that was what the patient desired. So on the Head and Neck Cancer Australia website, I just wanted to share the tips for socialising, which were developed by Marin Finlay, who is um, such a well-recognised researcher in this area. And this just provides some practical strategies that are easily accessible on the website. So for patients with swallowing difficulties, as I spoke of earlier, it can be things like choosing soups or knowing if you can manage you know, soft, soft, um, soft foods and ensuring there's source available. Also egg-based meals, desserts, and also considering, you know, if you're needing to be on thick and fluids, that this could be an option that you could take it with you. Um, with a reduced appetite, um, you know, maybe choosing to catch up with someone for, you know, a drink, uh, like a, a coffee or, or a morning tea, rather than it being sort of a, a lunch or a dinner, maybe a good strategy. Um, if you're experiencing a dry or so sore mouth, um, there's many um, products out there, saliva replacement products and just general mouth moisturizing products, which could be beneficial um, to use prior to eating to give you, make you feel more comfortable. Again, adding moisture to meals and also having frozen treats on hand could be more, more appealing. Um, and taste changes, which affects so many people. And we see a lot of food aversion and having to work around that and supporting our patients. So really experimenting with different um, flavors. And I guess if you're catching up with people, if you know that you're, you know, you're getting more pleasure out of tasting sweet foods, and that's the one taste sensation coming back, you know, choosing to catch up for a dessert. And similarly, if it was something more savory, you know, choosing, choosing to catch up with someone where, where those options were available to you. Um, and nausea and vomiting, you know, food aromas can really trigger, trigger that. So if you were catching up with anyone, you know, looking for options where, where you don't have that, you're not able to smell the food, um, colder foods are, um, are a lot less sort of offensive in that setting. Um, they're just some options that can work. So overall, some practical strategies um, 
that could benefit uh, to plan ahead. So, you know, if you are going out looking at what are the options available at where I'm going, um, looking at meal modifications, sort of as um, we spoke about earlier, a bit of trial and error to sort of feel confident knowing when you're going out that this is a limitation for what I feel confident to eat out in front of people. Always exploring options. So, um, yeah, just trialing different things. And, um, and if you are catching up with friends and family just in their environment, whether or not you could bring something yourself to share that you just feel really comfortable having. And overall, the big thing I wanna um, speak to about this topic is you know, the importance of us raising awareness. I think there, um, there needs to be more speaking up about the, the difficulties that patients and carers experience with the impact of head and neck cancer treatment and then going into the survivorship period, the impact on, the li on, on lifestyles. And as healthcare professionals, I think we need to be more involved in those conversations and look at really look at the big picture and look at better ways we can support, you know, not only the patient, but also carers with navigating, navigating these um, concerns. So thank you very much. I'll just stop sharing my slide. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, we did that in record time. So <laughs> So you covered a lot in uh, in your um, in your presentation from your study, and then some 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 um, experience and, and sharing of what um, uh, your participants in your research told you, but also you picked up on some of your tips. I guess I just wanted to. Um, I haven't seen any questions coming through yet. So I'll just see. Um, someone was saying that it wasn't working, but we'll see how we go. Um, but one of the questions, I guess, from you as a dietitian, was there anything that was coming through your research um, that was surprising to you from what you were hearing? Was there anything that you were learning that would um, that has actually you think will help you in your practice as a dietitian from what you've learned through your research? Yeah, I think a really key finding from my research was really um, looking at the, the the needs of the carer as well, because they play, you know, they're doing, most of them are doing a lot of that background, that work in the background. And especially in the surgical setting, you know, we can be seeing the patients on the ward, but we're not always getting the opportunity to speak to the carer. And um, sometimes I can feel really unsure of the best way to support the patients, yeah. you know, when they come home. And, you know, when you're talking about patients going home needing like a texture modified diet, maybe needing to manage, um, you know, tube feeds and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, it can be a really big task and a massive um, upheaval in their life. So one big thing that I want to move forward with is really looking at that carer engagement in the care we're providing. Yeah. Um, almost just fr and from the get go, ensuring that um, we can support them so that yeah, they can best support the patient um, with that sort of thing. And of course, ongoing to continue to support the patient in the best way possible. And I think um, like, you know, highlighting today the impact of head and neck cancer treatment um, on eating and drinking socially, you know, that's also a big factor we have to consider. So really doing this research, I think it's been really good to focus more on the big picture at times. You know, obviously we've got as clinicians, you know, we we do have set things that we were working on, but also incorporating what that looks like um, in the big picture for patients and carers as well. Yeah, because foods, food we we eat for nourishment, but it is mm. so much more to it, isn't it, in terms yeah. of emotional and social and so forth. So it, it, it's such a big issue. And um, I think that uh, it was really insightful reading some of those quotes that you had and what you were presenting to us. And um, and as you said, I think that the hearing the impact that that has on the family as a whole and the way that the family may change their own um, eating patterns to help accommodate and to help um, uh, for the, the person who's going through that treatment to feel more inclusive, included and, um, and, uh, and be part of that. So um, I think that was an interesting part too. So I'm just having a look to see, um, one of the questions we did have come through um, before our webinar, Joanne, was really looking at what 
and I think you've kind of touched on it a little bit just from what we have in conversation, but what the sort of support and guidance or education do you know that pa patients receive prior to their treatments or surgery and at which, it, which um, stages, I guess, um, on the effects of nutrition and their ability to eat and drink normally. Um, and it might be interesting to hear pe other people's view who are online, who are dietitians, perhaps too, you might want to make a comment or, or contribute to this as well. Yes, yeah, so I'll speak because um, I've had um, coming from the Royal Brisbane Hospital, we've got a pathway where we identify patients based on their surgery, the, their tumour type, um, their current sort of nutrition status and um, yeah, with and yeah, just knowing the type of treatment they're having, we we identify if they're at high nutrition risk, meaning they're more likely to be losing weight or it's going to be very challenging to keep up that um, nutrition intake. We we actually book them in for pre-treatment education, whether that's prior to surgery or the, their chemotherapy and radiation um, for those patients. So, um, and part of that pathway can be where we recommend prophylactic gastrostomy tube placement for some of these patients. So from a nutrition point of view, a lot of the education will be around what a gastrostomy tube is. Um, and of course, it's completely up to the patient, but the, you know, they make, a decision we're providing the information so they can make a well-informed decision so we talk about sort of our nutrition goals the role of what tube feeding could be for them through treatment and sort of what strategies we may put into place you know talking through whether or not a texture modified diet may be needed talking about you know prioritizing protein and energy and that sort of thing in their diet and we always try and base that around their current intake and in any way, if we see the opportunity to try and optimise their nutrition prior to them even starting the treatment. Yeah. So, because some people may come through and um, not have any difficulty eating and drinking currently, but we just know that um, with treatment, they'll, they're more at risk of having some difficulty, whereas others may already have lost a lot of weight prior to treatment because sometimes the impact of the tumour can already be affecting their chewing or their swallowing um, and they can experience weight loss yep. so um yeah great, great. yeah thanks thanks joanne um i'm just seeing okay we have um a question um on mainly a liquid diet and oh this person says they're mainly on a liquid diet and how do you add calories or protein to maintain weight in a liquid diet um yeah so that's where we can we talk about you know we've got our standard oral nutrition supplements, those so things like um, Sustagen and Ensure. And if you, um, someone had a preference to be making up their own drinks at home, we'd always encourage adding um, a protein powder. So whether or not that's a flavoured powder or if they didn't like the taste of that, there's, there are neutral flavoured protein supplements that can be added. So you could still be making up a fruit smoothie if that was your preference um, and not necessarily needing to add a vanilla or strawberry flavour to that. Um, and similarly, if um, with a liquid diet where if, you know, having soups, you know, that's where something like a sustagen neutral could be added. And it's things like adding extra butter, cream, cheese, you know, in the savoury options you're having. Um, yeah. And, and similarly with the smoothie things, you could add cream or yogurt, ice cream, those sorts of things to really get more calories and protein. Sounds pretty yum to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And thanks for... Uh, I think that was Vivian. Um, okay, we've got another one here. Should I be taking iron tablets due to not eating meats? That's a good question. Um, that would definitely be a question for your for your doctor. Um, yeah, to check on the levels and um, for them to advise. Yeah, we don't advise strictly on that. Uh, there's another one here. How to deal with a horrible taste of water after the RT. My radio oncologist encourages me to drink lots of water, but I simply can't. <laughs> yes, this is very common, very, very common. Um, I often say to people, you know, just try, could you try some cordial or, you know, whether it's, whether they're needing it to be sweet or even just a touch of cordial, um, just to sort of take away from that taste. Um, just really trying to troubleshoot what, in what way can we make get a fluid option in that's more palatable for you? Um, and just remembering things like milk also contribute to your fluid intake. But my first sort of you know line of defence there is always just trialling different cordials and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, another one. Um, meals take so much longer. Oh, um, this is probably just a comment more, but meals that take so much longer that this person says they don't interact in order to keep up. So it's trying to, I suppose, focus on the eating. And then the, the I suppose, what this um, Greg's saying here is that the ability then to socialise is much more challenging because you're just trying to focus on the eating. So I think that that's, yeah. good, and I'm sure that's something that's um, shared by many who are on the um on the call today you know in the similar situations with head and neck cancer so that's probably more a comment so thanks for that comment um another another question here my husband's problem is too much saliva has anyone any answers to this problem do you have anything joe that you can um add or is anyone else able to help with this from their own experiences please add on to the chat yeah, I, I would be very keen to hear from others who, yeah. <laughs> um, for what they use. But I, I, I do know, yeah, some people can struggle with this. Um, yeah, and often need to have have a tissue or, or a wipe there, sort of to manage. Um, sometimes, actually, people find having a bit of like soda water or something to sort of cut through. If it is sort of a thicker secretion, a bit of soda water, to maybe to cut through a bit prior to eating. But um, I would be very keen to hear what what other people find may work for them. Great, Joe. Um, I'll see if anything comes up. Um, I've got another uh, question here about adding almond butter and uh, oh, someone's saying that they add almond butter and peanut butter to smoothies to add calories. Yeah, great, great, yeah, great. Yeah. Well done to you. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think there's a few coming out, a few comments coming on about the saliva issue. <laughs> oh, good. So I think there's a number of just saying that it, it is it is a challenge and not an easy fix. Wish there was. Um, uh, uh, for excess saliva, someone says sometimes they use a nebulizer can be helpful for helping clear secretions and making their um, that easier to cough spit out. So yeah, yeah, that is a very good strategy. Yeah, so thanks for sending in that strategy. It's always helpful to get tips to help others. And also helpful for our healthcare professionals online to provide some of these tips or ideas or, or suggestions back that others have um, found helpful. Um, there's one here, it says, I find my diet does influence the frog spawn, as I call it. <laughs> um, so I think that I've got through, is there, I don't think there's any other questions that are coming through. So how about we move to um, our next speaker. Um, now, Yvonne is an author, a coach, and the founder of the No Feeding Tubes podcast and the Mind Food Body program. And this is a program that's specifically designed to assist other with others with dysphagia. And... The and the transition from pe uh, peg feed back to oral eating. So that's what the focus is. Now, Yvonne was living in Vietnam when she was diagnosed with oropharyngeal cancer or tonsil cancer back in November 2018. She went on to have a third of her tongue removed, uh, both tonsils, uh, 30 lymph nodes, and 30 chemo radio and had 30 chemo radiotherapy sessions. She also had a peg uh, feed, tube feed for 15 months. She's written her own transition story in Easy Follow, Easy Swallow, love the, the title, and a self-help guide to eating your best food live following head and neck cancer treatment. So this, it's wonderful to have you on. You're here. We were a bit worried you weren't going to be here, but you're here and you're smiling and that's good to, um, good to see. Um, now, we're going to do this session a little differently to how we ran the one with Joanne. I'm going to, we're going to have a bit of a conversation. I'm going to have a bit of a conversation with Yvonne. I'm going to ask her a few questions. So it's going to be a little bit, um, a bit like a um, an interview um, style. So uh, can, can you hear me more? We can, we can, Yvonne. <laughs> Yay. You and Yay. I can hear each other. Let's hope everybody can hear us. And it's great that people are letting us know because um, I can I can see on the chat people letting us know. So please let us know if you can't hear us. 
or something goes astray. So it looks like we're all good. So that's great. Yay. Yes, people said they can hear us both. So we're all good now, Yvonne. So that's great. So welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Thank and you. And for sharing your experience. And it's, um, it's been a bit of a four-year journey so far. You've just ticked over your four years, haven't you? Yes. So as I said in the introduction, and we kind of know a little bit about you, and you've been so busy since um, your diagnosis, but perhaps you could just briefly tell us a little bit, anything else about yourself that perhaps it might be of interest. Um, and uh, we know yeah. you were diagnosed in Vietnam, but, you know, what? what well, I wasn't actually it? diagnosed oh. in Vietnam. They thought it was a um, really bad tonsillitis. And I said, no, I don't think so. Um, so just to correct that. Yeah, okay. I didn't get diagnosed until I got home to Adelaide and I came home for a very different reason. Uh, I was about to start a new, should I just launch in? <laughs> yeah, launch in and I'll come and ask you a few questions okay. so that we go along the way. But just a little bit about how you responded to your diagnosis and a little yeah. bit about your treatment, you know, just briefly, sure. just to set the scene for people. And I must apologise for being late to the party. We've had a few little um, issues here in, in my home this morning. So uh, my apologies for everyone who was waiting perhaps for me to be introduced. Um, Yes, look, I had a sore throat for a, oh, I think it was about seven or eight months. And I remember it because I had to go to a dinner for a um, a sponsor's dinner that I was doing. And I can remember wanting to eat sorbet so that it would calm my throat. So I remember exactly the day I noticed it. I know exactly how long I had that sore throat for. So when I was finally diagnosed there was a bit of relief for me because I'd actually been misdiagnosed two or three times um, in Vietnam and uh, they tried all sorts of things nebulizers and saline drips and washes and antibiotics and you know so by the time someone had finally diagnosed it in many respects I was relieved because I'd put up with that sore throat for so long so um but having said that, uh, I had a girlfriend with me for most of the process because um, I didn't. I don't have a care. I don't have a another half. So it was just me, uh, and I'm very much an independent, travel the world, try anything once type of person. So um, you know, I had to manage the process very much on my own, and uh, I think within that. Um, my sense sense of strength, um, my focus and my mental agility became very important in terms of how I managed the process of healing um, after the the treatment. and and just I will just preface this by saying, in many ways, uh, I'm lucky compared to a lot of other people who have um, disfigurements and different parts of their body removed and I do tend to make light of a lot of this and please don't be offended by that it's the way that I deal with it it's the way that um, I come from an Irish Scottish background and that's the way that we deal with things is with the sense of humor and an open and honest communication style so it's not my intention to offend anybody. No, I wouldn't have thought that, Yvonne. I think, um, as you said, this is your experience and how you deal with it, and everybody's different. But um, the fact that you were doing it on your own um, and you had to you had to call on some of your inner yeah, inner I had to rally to through, yeah. And we'll talk <laughs> a little sure. bit more about how you manage that in a little in in a moment. But um, now we do know that there are some people on uh, on the line today that have permanent um, peg feet, but you had one for fifteen months. Can you tell us just a little bit about your experience um, and what it was like for you, and what did you find, I guess, the most challenging about ha about having them? The, having the peg tip, yeah, well, it was interesting. Um, my surgeon sort of swung past the bed one morning and said, "Oh, by the way, I think we're going to put a peg tube in you." And I went, "Oh, okay." <laughs> Uh, because A, I didn't know what a peg tube was. B, I was so off my head on, um, you know, any number of drugs that I was on at the time. And 
I can remember the morning that my speech language pathologist walked in to, I was still in hospital at this point, and she sort of looked at me because I didn't even know there was speech language pathologists. I didn't even know they were a thing. And she looked at me and she said, just by the way, you may have this for the rest of your life. And I remember that exact moment and I went, no, 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 no. That's not going it was, to, it was fear. I, I just remember, and I, she said to me sometime later, I remember seeing the fear in your eyes. Um, so at that point, at that exact moment, I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is serious. And that's the first time I ever thought that this whole thing was serious. Uh, so whether I was in denial, whether I was um, so drugged, I just wasn't responding, I don't know. But I do remember that fear. And I do remember thinking to myself, no way. And there were reasons behind that. And, and the motivation for me getting off that peg was my whole life until that point had been um, doing big events, um, I'm a qualified uh, chef. I, I've cooked all my life. Food was my life. Um, eating, drinking, wine making, wineries, you know, that's what I did. I talked for a living. I cooked for a living. Um, I did big events for a living. So everything was just taken away from me like that. Um, so that was so, my so motivation. How, how then, Yvonne, did you manage over that 15 months, you know, that you had, you had to, you know, you had to have it. So how did you how did you manage? And you know, if you've got any sort of tips for particularly for anyone who might be on online or even yeah. uh, from a health professional perspective, how did you um yeah, who are new to it? How did you manage while you had I, it? I can remember um I'll just digress for a while. I remember yeah. going in for a chemotherapy session. I had my tube uh, and I used to take in my own food to the hospital. M my own food being those commercial bottles of whatever they gave us um and I can remember another man sitting across from me and his wife or girlfriend was cleaning his peg tube running around doing everything for him and I remember thinking there were two things that I thought how lucky is he and then I thought how unlucky is he because I think uh, in retrospect I think um the fact that I was on my own meant that I had to come to terms with it very quickly because there was no one looking after me, no one washing my tubes, no one washing my flushes, my syringes, my bowls, my whatever. So I had to come to terms with it very, very quickly. Um, and I was living on my own. So it was, just, you know, and in answer to Joanne talking about carers, it's kind of the flip side of the coin for me. So I came to terms with it very quickly. I also know that um, I was becoming more, the longer I was on the peg, the more removed I was getting from food um, because I wasn't shopping, I wasn't cooking, I certainly wasn't eating anything and I started to lose the sensations in my mouth um, and I went through, like everybody else, the nausea, the smell of food, water tasted awful, everything tasted peculiar. Um, and, you know, and coming from a wine background, that was very unusual for me. From a psychological point of view, that was very hard for me to get my head around that. But I had to, and I had to do it quickly. But that connection to food was the one that was the other motivator too. So I I used my garden. That's what I did in the end. And I don't know if I've answered your question there or not, Kellyanne. No, you, no, I think you have. It's just more to do with then. So you, you you've highlighted the things that were really tricky and challenging, um, and I guess that's not you. As you said, it wouldn't be unique to you. But but you had to, as you said, you had to get on with it. You had to deal with it. So what are there any things that you did to help you? get over some of those things that you were um mm. that you were experiencing in terms yeah. of challenges I mean from your psychological you were talking about being in your garden I assume but how did you cope with some of those issues around drinking and eat you know how did you deal with oh, that I, I didn't I, I I literally didn't uh, I mean I was very lucky that COVID hit because COVID at that point meant that I just hibernated like everybody else, I shut down. Uh, no one was going out anyway, so I didn't have that added pressure of trying to be social. 
Uh, and I'm very careful about what I tell people about this because COVID really came in right as I was uh, at that really bad stage. And for those that are at the beginning of this, it does get better. Um, but uh, I used yoga, I used meditation, and it all sounds very um, cliche, but I did. I had to get my mind right. And I think from a medical practitioner's point of view, that's something that isn't focused on enough, uh, notwithstanding the the social distancing, the lack of food confidence, yeah. the mental part of it is as big as the physical part of it and the trying to uh, come to terms with the fact that you're not eating, you can't eat, you can't eat, breathe and talk at the same time. So, um you know, I had to come to terms, but I had to accept it. I think acceptance was something that took me mm. a very long time to get my head around. The fact that I wasn't the person that I was before, and I had to accept that. And I had to uh, draw on a lot of mental strength and being honest with myself, as well as being honest with others uh, to get through that, particularly in the early stages, I think. Yeah. Well, now that you're um, a few de years down the track, what, what, um, where, um, I guess, what steps have you taken to really achieve um, that socially? I mean, I know COVID's still around, but we've kind of moved on a little bit. But um, yeah. so, what steps? What have you done to really achieve that um, uh, social food life now that you are able to? So, what are some of the things that you've done to really build? You talked about confidence, so you would have, as you said, lost quite a bit of confidence during that period so what have you done to try and help lift that again and to get you out there socially being able to um, engage in, and connect through eating I think the first thing that I really did come to terms with is actually telling people about what had happened to me um, I went through a process of uh, public speaking was a was a part of my role um, talking to groups of people, leading people. Um, and a lot of that had to stop for me because I simply couldn't be understood. I mean, I've worked, uh, and for those that follow my YouTube channel or listen to my podcast, some of the reason as to why I did that was to give me the opportunity to practice my speech, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, when I sit here, I still drink water and drink tea and coffee in front of a camera and it takes me a little while, but I do it because everybody else does it. So why should I do yeah. it? And let's hope I don't choke and I always end up with something, you know, around me in case that happens. Um, I had a plan. I knew exactly what I was doing with my food um, and my drink. I knew what I could eat and what I couldn't. I was honest and upfront with everybody about what had happened to me. And that took me a long mm -hmm. time to get to that point. But I realized that if I wanted to go to conferences and I wanted to travel domestically or internationally or travel or do what I used to do, then I had to front up, fess up, tell people what had happened to me. And I came up with the what I call the elevator pitch, yeah. which is, Here's what's happened to me in three nanoseconds. Uh, and I applied that elevator pitch to anyone who wanted to listen to it, uh, <laughs> anyone who needed to listen to it. I use it in restaurants. I use it in pubs. I use it on aeroplanes. I, and it goes something like, hi, I've had head and neck cancer. The treatment that I have has meant this, 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 and this. Help me. And I can guarantee you nine times out of 10, people bend over backwards to help you. As soon as you say the C word, they're in. Um, and I use that to my advantage. Now, I, at one point, I used to try and hide it and pretend it didn't happen. And nah, bugger that. I just tell people now. Well, I think that's <laughs> a great, a great tip for, for anyone listening mm. um, today who might be feeling a little bit like you were or an earlier in their, their journey to actually have that little elevator pitch and to say that. And did you find, as you said, that once you put it out there, you were basically saying that people were, were very kind and accepting and and understanding um yeah. where some of you perhaps in the at the beginning as you said might have been lacking 
in confidence around that. But can I just um, perhaps, uh, perhaps you could give us a bit, well, you talked about travel and one of the questions that came through in the, um, uh, that was submitted prior was that people, someone was asking about travel and food and often if you have to be having, you know, creamy soups or, or something and they're not on offer, Mm. And you're not able to bring your food to a venue. How do you cope? How have you been able to cope? Because you've just come back from the Camino, mm. um, which is an amazing achievement having done that. And you would have had issues relating to food. So how have you managed? Can you give us some advice or some, some tips on how you I, I can tell you a funny that? story. Um, on my commit, when I walked, I took all these little packets of um miso uh, which is like a Japanese mm -hmm. paste that you use from uh, soybeans and I thought oh great I'll have hot water and I'll I'll have worst case scenario I can have a hot mug of miso well there wasn't a hotel on that whole walk that had a kettle in the room so that went out the window so in many ways it m made me try food that I thought I'll never manage that um so in answer to so specifically answer your question, uh, I've in the early days, I was always prepared with something that I knew I could eat. Um, I ignored very helpful um, head and neck cancer booklets that told me to snack on nuts, trail mix. Uh, there was all this sort of food that people told me that, and yet no you know have baked beans on muffins no I couldn't eat the bait I couldn't tolerate the skin on the baked beans um and we're all different so yeah. it wouldn't matter what you wrote it wasn't going to be right for everybody yeah. but we do know as a collective group of people that by visually looking at things we can pretty much go yeah no I'm not going to manage that or yeah, I reckon I could manage that. And the, the thing about travel and that walk that I just did was very much uh, giving me food confidence because in some moments I had talked myself into, now I'm never going to be able to eat that. And in fact, I could. So what you learned a year ago or 18 months ago may not necessarily apply now. Um, so, and that was one of the things that I did just want to tell anyone who's going through this today was, uh, and the practitioners that work, the medical team, is that the food confidence erosion is very real. And even I, you know, and look, I'm a pretty confident straight up person and, um, uh, you know, I, I'll try anything once. <laughs> and even for me, I noticed on that trip that I've just come back from literally weeks ago that my food confidence had been eroded so much and I wasn't aware that it had been. So I started to try things that I thought, no, nah, there's no way I'm going to be able to eat that. Um, but mostly I always had a plan. I always had plan B. I was always prepared. Um, I took what people told me with the pinch of salt because what worked for me doesn't necessarily work for others uh, and I think you've just got to be confident enough to try things and yeah there was a risk that I might choke yes there was a risk that I might drown in my own saliva but uh, for me and this is just for me and my lived experience um, it was worth the, the risk and it was worth the get over that little mile, you know, that little hurdle to make my food life just that little bit better. And now I've got a lot more confidence than I used to have. I should right. take breath there because I can talk about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's that's great. I mean, I think uh, what you're saying too, Yvonne, and I, it's unfortunate that we haven't been able to watch the videos, but Pete, please feel free to go onto the website and have a look because I think some of the things that you're talking about your experience Yvonne many have said similar things around the the issue of persevering being willing and getting that confidence and it might start small but to actually try new things and mm. you may be surprised at what you can do so I think that some of those things um and uh obviously this lack of as you said food confidence is important um there's a few things coming up on the chat and some commentary which we might pick up on in a minute I'm just looking at the time but um I guess just one one last thing um is really around um 
so what what encourage you know what got you then doing the kind of work that you're doing what's motivated you to to do your podcast and to get engaged in all the things that you're now involved in um since you've your diagnosis so so what sort of got you um uh what's encouraged you to do those sorts of things is it because you didn't you felt you didn't have that <laughs> That uh, to, yeah, well. to a degree. Um, I've, I've also come from a, um, a professional career around groups of members, membership-based organisations. So I've always dealt with uh, or worked in and around like-minded groups of people. So I think uh, I felt that as a collective group of people, it doesn't matter how often we sit around and do this unless you've been through the treatment you don't really get it and I I think because I've been through the treatment and as I said before earlier you know I'm in a much better place than a lot of people and I recognize that um but I think the nuances of what this treatment can do to you and where it leaves you on a social physical emotional romantic life level um, can only truly be understood by someone else who's been through it. And yes. I felt that I was able to offer people a um, a safe environment to talk to someone about it that got it, um, someone who had research, you know, things like IDSI. Why, why didn't anyone ever tell me about IDSI, for God's sake? Uh, food textures, why didn't anyone ever talk to me about that? And I just found by talking to other people that, they didn't know about it either. And because I come from an event planning background, my nature is to itemise, create plans. This is the way we can do it. And if it all goes horribly wrong, then we can do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thought using those life skills that I had um, could potentially help other people take away that overwhelm. And there's so much overwhelm in this treatment so much information and you're on a such a cocktail of drugs um I just mapped it for people I think yeah well thank you Yvonne we might pause there because that's been um terrific to hear your journey and to see how far you've come and um and I I think as you were yeah anyway it's been great and the what you're doing uh, to help others and I think it's also been really it's probably really interesting for our um health professionals to hear some of the information potentially that's not being conveyed to to patients that perhaps is really important mm. um you know some of those other things that perhaps are a little bit more um discreet or, or indirect than the than the bigger things so um so I really appreciate your commentary um okay I'm just going to have a look and see what we've got we've got lots of comments coming back lots of ex-chefs and food lovers like yourself <laughs> Yvonne isn't that cruel it's just cruel that uh, it's, uh so lots of people who we're the worst patients <laughs> <laughs> absolutely can um identify with with you so you, you're in uh you're in good hands there um uh what have we got here oh um I think someone's saying you know agreeing with you about it's um it's, it's such a mental game and um and uh other people have said that they've actually connected with you through um online support groups and um and have, have experienced um your story before and got a lot out of it and so they're thanking you for it um someone has said they're 18 months on and still have no taste not sure if it will ever come back um but um perhaps slowly slowly but um as you said everyone the, the is taste different. issue is an interesting one Kelly Ann because um actually whoever I, I can't see who put that up but that for me was a shocker like and anyone here who's from a food and or wine background wine still tastes like rocket fuel and I used to be the person that flew around Australia going to wineries so uh, that was a really hard one, but I found my taste did come back. And even now, ev even today and yesterday, I still have sensation in my chin, my tongue, my taste buds. Um, it's renewing all the time. So, well, that's encouraging that mm. every is seen little bit by bit. Um, someone has said here, accepting new you is when you can emotionally move on, but this is very hard, as you've said. So I think there's a lot of people who 
your story is resonating, aspects of it is resonating with them. Um, uh, I'm just having a look. Yes, or people are just saying exactly yes. As you were talking, they're commenting about that you're a great inspiration to people. So that's that's a lovely thing to see. Um, acceptance is the key. Um, uh, oh, someone has said, does saliva glands come back? That's what they struggle with at night. So that's... Um, yeah, you got the same. <laughs> I tell you, one of the biggest things now that I'm, I'm for those that are listening, I'm nearly five years out. I'll be five years out next March. And um, the, the biggest issue for me was the fact that all my teeth moved and I had to learn how to re-clean my teeth with floss and things. Um, yes. And I will say from a food perspective, that uh, is one of the biggest things is oral hygiene. And I'm religious about it, uh, and I think it's helped me a lot uh, because I have ORN, um, all my teeth have moved, um, and I was always a bit of a teeth girl anyway, but certainly that's helped my food journey too. I'll be quiet now because I can no, talk about no, this. No, no, and I think people <laughs> would be would be happy to listen to you for the whole afternoon because I'm seeing. I just keep seeing lots of great comments coming in, um, and uh, it's nice because it's been a pretty ordinary morning. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone's going to tell anyone what happened this morning, but never mind. I'm just seeing if there's anything else. Someone's sending some links, so I'm sure everyone's looking at those. Um, uh now I don't I cannot pronounce this, but I'm sure, I'm sure you will know what it is. Xylomelts, is it? Xylomelts have been a savior, someone has said, um, which is good. And um and it works for restaurant in restaurants if they don't serve soup and that's all you can have. So lots of little tip tidbits are coming through from others on the on the um, call which is fantastic so adding to the conversation that we've been having here Yvonne but we might um, in the interest of time here we might bring um, so thank you so much uh, um, for your for your story and I've learned a lot myself and um, it's uh, you you are an inspiration how you've managed to keep that um, and I think that's come through even in the in the um, videos that we weren't able to see today the, you know, trying to keep positive, trying to keep recognizing that this is a to persevere, keep trying different things, keep trying to and to actually tell people, I love the idea of the elevator pitch. Just get it out there, tell it, get it out there, and then people know what their um what the your situation is. So um that was that was great. We might just quickly bring up, we've got a few, just only a few minutes. So I don't think we've got too many other questions here that unless there's anything Nadia that I have missed in the chat for either Joanne or Yvonne or anything uh, that either one wants to mention before we no uh, Kelly I just thought Gary Gary's from the central coast in New South Wales and he was the person who was talking about you know not always being able to bring something along to a restaurant or on, on a plane and he said that he's recently um got a doctor's certificate that um, explains his severe xerostomia and then allows him, I mean, you shouldn't have to do this, right? But anyway, that now allows him to, um, to carry suit for, you know, with him um, on board or uh, wherever he needs to go. So thanks, Gary, for, mm. for adding, adding that in. But, and it is a real shame that we weren't able to show the videos because, I mean, um, I think like you, Yvonne, having your, you know, elevator pitch, but... Um, a couple of people did talk about um, just, you know, obviously people out in public, they, they might be curious, they might watch or stare, they might ask questions. And if they do ask questions, they're, they're genuinely interested and will be sympathetic and more than happy to, you know, to try to do what they can to help. And I think with head and neck cancer, unfortunately, it's not, you know, it, it is a less common cancer. And and so people aren't aware um, necessarily of, of the challenges that people face. And I think the more that we all um, tell people about it, then hopefully that will, you know, both get the support that you need when you're going about your daily lives, um, but also raise awareness about head and neck cancer and, and the need that people have for support. Can I say this, Nadia? This is something funny that happened at the International Airport because I was carrying through water because, you know, we're always chugging water. And, of course, they won't let you go through with water. So um, I had a little, 
a little jam card, just a minute card that I learned from the UK. And I gave it to the, you know, the people checking all the late. Anyway, they let me through with it because I told them what was going on. So I think it's really important to be up front where you can. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we need to have like the diabetics have their the yeah. risk alert. Maybe there needs to be something similar for people with head and neck cancer. Another yeah. idea to add to our yeah. list. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kelly, thank you very much. I'm very conscious that we're nearly yeah. we're nearly out of time. So um, first, I just want to thank our um, our speakers um, because obviously we can't put on these webinars without your expertise and you know lived experience. So thank you very much. Um, it is a shame that we couldn't show the videos, but look, they are on our website, and I'd really encourage you to go and and have a listen to them because there's just some just some fabulous um, you know one of the carers in particular just captures so beautifully. Um, the importance of even if you're on a permanent peg tube, the importance of still going out and about and being social because it's too important not to be. Life's too lonely um, to not do that. So I'd encourage you to go listen to those um, those videos. I've sent the link. Um, Kelly, thank you very much for hosting today's webinar. And I'd also just like to thank the Western and Central Melbourne Integrated Cancer Service who gave us a grant to host um, the webinars this year. Um, so really appreciate everyone's support this year. It's been another busy one for Head and Neck Cancer Australia and um, 2023 is shaping up to be, um, you know, another busy year. But we really do rely on um, the feedback that we get from the community, particularly when running webinars like today. So there will be a survey um, sent around, please let us know, um, other than the tech issues, which we're obviously very aware of, um, but please let us know if there's topics that you'd like us to cover um, in the future and we'll do our best to, um, to do that. And I'm wishing everyone a really happy festive season and new year and all the best, whether you're someone who's going through treatment, recovering from treatment or having those lifelong side effects. We hope today has been somewhat helpful and we wish you all the very best. So thank you again, everyone and have a great day.